Uh, is it Mueller? Or... Yeah, I'm recording. Oh, hey, oh, are, you, are you also like letting people in the room? Yep, I will be in charge of that. Yeah, so we just wanted to welcome everyone to Balkan Circle. Our, we're kicking off our spring 2024 series. My name is Mary Newberger. I'm a professor um, of history here at UT Austin and also the director of our Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies. And Kirill is my co-host. Thank you very much, uh, Mary. I'm very, very happy that we are yet opening a new season of Balkan Circle, that experiment that started a couple of years ago and now is institutionalized. And come Friday, and uh, all things Balkan uh, are uh, here is the place to be. My name is Kirill Avramov. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Slavic and Eurasian Studies. I'm a political scientist. And I'm very interested uh, to hear the talk today uh, from our esteemed guest. I'll ask my colleague, uh, uh, Chelsea uh, O'Huere, uh, to introduce our speaker today. And I'm looking forward to a very lively discussion. Chelsea. Great. Thanks, Carol and Mary. So I'm very excited to be interest, introducing you all to Dr. Lori Amy today. Um, so Dr. Lori Amy is a professor of cultural studies and writing, specializing in trauma and memory studies. She received her BA in English from the University of Hawaii and her MA in English and rhetoric from the University of California at San Diego and a PhD in English specializing in cultural studies and critical theory from the University of Florida. From 1999 until 2019, Dr. Amy taught at Georgia Southern University, where she also served as the, the director of the Women's and Gender Studies Program from 2003 until 2009. Her research focuses on how structural and cultural violence shape subjectivity and on practices for transforming the conditions that breed violence. From 2009 to 2010, which is when we met, Dr. Amy was a Fulbright Scholar in Albania, where she conducted fieldwork with families persecuted by the communist regime and the human rights organizations serving them. She later served as the academic director and human rights coordinator for the Albanian NGO that she co-founded, Autonomy, and that's O-T-T-O-N-O-M-Y, uh, from 2015 to 2020, and as a consultant for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe on developing and implementing a national platform on dialogue for opening the secret police files of the former communist regime. So that was from 2014 to 2018. She left Georgia Southern in 2019 as an ethical response to a critical moment in her work in Albania. Subsequently, she served as the political advisor to the deputy prime minister in Kosovo's first Vedvin dossier government. Dr. Amy has recently returned to the U.S., where she is concentrating her work on trauma-informed policy and practice. Uh, Dr. Amy's published widely on the subjects of cultural and collective violence in the U.S. and Albania. She received the 2015 Pan Albania Award for her work on research. I'm sorry, Pan Albania Award for her work researching and recording the lives of victims of state violence in Albania. She documents this in her current book project, Time Travels Through Albania, A Love Letter from the Future. Please help me welcome Dr. Lori Amy today, whose talk is entitled Ethical Responsibility of Research, a Case Study from Albania. Thank you, Chelsea. <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for letting me test out with you some of the ethical dilemmas with which I am currently grappling. Um, and so what I'm going to do is kind of walk you with me through how I ended up in Albania and what my life there has involved. And um, what we're talking about today is going to be coming out in Time Travels for Albania, a love letter from the future, but I still have some revamping to do. So I'm also excited about the opportunity to speak with you as I'm in the revamping process. Um so I want to open up with my questions. What I'm concerned with here is how does the United States researcher inhabit the interrelated webs of power, money, and violence in development? Which begs the question, what are the interrelated webs of power, money, and violence in development? And then most crucially for me, what are the ethical stakes of the choices we make about how to act on what we learn in the course of our research. 
Now, um, these questions are not merely academic for me. To, to engage these questions, I want to bring you with me to Sariat, an Ottoman era villa smack dab in the middle of the most expensive real estate in Albania's capital city, Tirana, in what used to be an historic center of the city. So I'm about to show you a video. Um, which is going to involve me being a bit discombobulated as I do a screen share and bring it up. But you are going to look with me at five minutes of where I passed midnight on the 16th of August, 2021, and sat the long hours through the morning of the 17th as Kabul was falling to the Taliban the night the developers set fire to Sariat. And this, let me share the screen. Is where I was and where I want to take you with me. So, are we seeing that share screen? Okay. Yes, we also see the um, dialogue box. This is, yeah. Right, I'm just getting to that right now. So we're going to go back to the beginning, make the sound come on. Okay, here we go. I'm not hearing any sound. I'm not sure if it's important to the video. It is important. I'm hearing sound. It's not coming through there. Yes, no sound. <laughs> when you do share screen, there's a, did you hit the button where you share sound as well? Which is a separate one. All right, I'm looking for the share sound. I think you need to unshare and then go back in. And sh when you share it, before really? you share it, you have to click that. Yeah. Okay. So if I've got share screen. Then kind of look down when you're, you know. Advanced sharing options. Multiple. Hmm. When you do share screen, when you first click the button, look down at the very bottom. And it says share uh, sound. Uh-huh. Do you see that little thing that you can click? You can check. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. All right. Let's try it again. Okay. Okay. <laughs> What you're looking at here is the chief of the fire department after arsonists have set fire to this historical monument. And we're all blocked out on the street. Get in so that people can start putting the fire out. Because we've called the fire trucks. Rudy Arabera is one of the most celebrated writers in the country. And he's managed to get into the house. Now we're still all blocked out on the street. No fire trucks coming. This is one of the most beautiful heritage sites in the city. And basically the conversation is, let us in, let us in, this is a, this is a, a terror. We need to be... <laughs> 
Ou tu fiques m'sieur Ou tu connais fiques n'you Ou tu connais fiques n'you Ou tu dis So these are Albanians, so they've pushed their way in. I'm going to fast forward a little bit. And what you'll see is that they get in. Now there's a discussion about how big the fire is. We have water. We had positioned barrels. So now people are in, they found water. With this, my my more apparatus. And they're about my more apparatus with this. Put them down. Can you get the cop? Pop up. Now that goes on for an hour while we're all putting the fire out. Um, I say we, I didn't actually go into the house. I was um, on the outside devastated because I was watching seven years of my life go up in flames. Um, so I wanted to give you a sense of this because I want you to understand that my questions about how we inhabit the interrelated webs of power, money, and violence are not academic. So <clears throat> I'll return to how I ended up as Kabul was falling, watching seven years of my life and work go up in flames. But first, I want to give you a brief snapshot of how I got here. Um, I was sure in 20, 2001, hold on a second. Before I go on, I want to just get a visual of you all. Um, okay, good. See, I need to be able to see you now. <laughs> I was still stuck in the other screens. So, okay, much better now I get to see you. Uh, so 25 years ago, I was sure that the U.S.-led war on terror was reshaping global consciousness. And I was sure of this because I was born on an army base in the former West Germany at the height of the Cold War. And my life showed me how war spreads exponentially from the battlefield to the bedroom. And that in war, there are no winners, only victims. And I saw how violence shapes the identities the subjectivities of war's proliferating victims. So it was actually my drive to understand how the war on terror was reshaping global consciousness that sent me to Albania as a Fulbright scholar in 2009. I worked there with public health officials on developing theoretical frameworks and policy recommendations for understanding violence as a public health problem. When I arrived in Albania, there was very little information available in English about the extent or brutality of Albania's Cold War totalitarian dictatorship. In fact, in 2009, there was very little scholarly analysis about Albania at all. It has been a blind spot in Balkan studies, even more so to the rest of the world. And this brings me to my first point about the interrelated webs of power, money, and violence in development, and how we, as U.S. researchers, inhabit this web. The first obvious bow I need to make here is to the significant body of work on how knowledge is produced, disseminated, consumed, and to what ends. So my understanding of this has been shaped by analyses of hegemonic power structures, the subaltern, and the broad spectrum of work on center and periphery, on othering, and I am particularly grounded in feminist standpoint theory. But my baseline for today is much more personal. And this baseline is inflected by Anne McClintock in Imperial Leather, Ray Chow in The Age of the World Target, Judith Butler on Giving an Account of Oneself, 
and particularly Kelly Oliver in Witnessing Beyond Recognition and Margaret Urban Walker in Moral Repair, Reconstructing Moral Relations After Wrongdoing. So my fundamental first question in thinking through how we, as U.S. researchers, inhabit the interrelated webs of power, money, and violence in development is, what are we doing when we go abroad to research? What gives us the right? Why do we, foreigners in a host country, think we are entitled to ask perfect strangers questions, to draw conclusions based on our very limited life world experience, to publish our analyses, our arguments, as though we have a claim to knowledge? And so to be clear, I did not go to Albania to write about Albania or Albanians. I went to Albania to see more clearly how the United States war on terror is reshaping consciousness. When I received the invitation to work with public health officials, I accepted because Albania is in the region where the war on terror was being raged. A few hundred miles west of Turkey, a few hundred miles further from Iraq, the Baltic states, Ukraine and Russia to the north and east, North Africa a short skip south across the Mediterranean Sea. It was, I believed, as good a place as any to start my research on the global effects of the U.S.-led war on terror. Given this starting point, it is particularly ironic that the night the developers set fire to Sarayat, Kabul was falling to the Taliban. So my first ethical question is, what is our responsibility to the people who talk to us? And here I do not mean the IRB human subjects research protocols. I mean something much more fundamental. When I learned in the course of researching collective and structural violence in Albania that upwards of 20% of Albanians have been violently persecuted by Albanian's totalitarian dictatorship, and that their plight was being denied, repressed, and covered up inside of Albania and was largely unknown to the rest of the world, I felt an ethical obligation to bear witness to the ongoing trauma of the people who opened their lives, their homes, and their hearts to me. So I spent the next six years working with former political prisoners families persecuted by Albania's dictatorship, and the multiple NGOs and international organizations vested and investing in human rights, post-communist transition, and democratization. Well, <clears throat> this work confronted me with the ways that international development workers are in fact complicit in the continuing perpetuation of collective trauma in Albania. Let me give you an early example of how my work confronted me with this. In June 2010, I had just returned to Tirana from Shkodra, a city you're very familiar with, Chelsea, in the northern Albanian Alps and historically important as a place of resistance to communist dictatorship. I had been stunned in my interviews to hear stories about public execution as late as 1988 and about the thousands of families who are still looking for the bodies of their loved ones executed by the regime. One of the regime's most perverse practices was to celebrate the executions on national television and radio. Each execution was announced as a victory of the dictatorship of the proletariat over the enemy of the state. But then the bodies were most generally buried in secret locations, not returned to the families. Frequently, they were dug up and reburied again in even more secret locations. So at a dinner with an eclectic group of hip embassy and aid workers, members of civil society in the local media, I told the group what I had learned. A woman with the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe stopped me short and told me, point blank, the 20 hours of interviews I had just conducted were lies. There were no public executions in Albania. 
I was a foreigner, she said. The people talking to me were taking advantage of my gullibility. But I was, as I said, at a dinner that included hip cosmopolitan Albanians. So I turned to the table and asked them, were there public executions in Albania? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. We all pulled out our cell phones and started calling other Albanians who had lived under the regime. Do you remember public executions under Hoxha's dictatorship? Yes, they said. Yes, 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 yes. To this day, thousands of Albanian families are still looking for the bodies of loved ones executed as enemies of the state and for Enver Hoxha's dictatorship. The International Commission for Missing Persons, which for over a decade has been trying to work with the government to locate mass graves and exhume remains to return to families, has been consistently thwarted in their efforts by the state. Prosecutors will not issue excavation permits, officials stonewall, lie, obstruct the commission's proceedings. This is an example of what Margaret Urban Walker calls normative abandonment. Normative abandonment is the failure of other people and institutions to acknowledge the injury done to the persecuted. The failure to reaffirm standards, place blame appropriately on wrongdoers, and offer some forms of solace, safety, and relief to the victims. For victims, it can be unendurable to be ignored to be denied credibility, or to run up against the fact that others, including those institutionally empowered to deal with crime and violence, do not seem to care about one's experience of violation and its consequences. This abandonment constitutes a second injury that incites further rage, resentment, indignation, and humiliation, and further poisons the relationship between individuals and social groups. While those with the privilege of not having to feel what the persecuted have felt may want to close books and move on, for those who have suffered wrongs that the society has not acknowledged and redressed, these books are still open and blood stains the page. So, international workers denying the reality of state terror that terrorized the people into submission, the government whitewashing state crime, thwarting the work of the International Commission for Missing Persons. I did not go to Albania to research and write about the living legacies of communist trauma, but it was, it was everywhere. I mean, everywhere I turned over and over again, I encountered the effects of this trauma on my students, my friends and my colleagues, and I encountered over and over again, the ignorance of the international community about this trauma. Well, I'm a trauma theorist. So seeing this, what was my ethical responsibility to the people asking me to tell their story? What were the ethical stakes of my choices about how to act on what I learned in the course of my research? I asked these questions to one of myself about my work in Albania, but also to all of us. American researchers watching at a pivotal historical moment in our country as legacies of trauma rip us apart. So as I walk you with me through my own ethical encounters about how to respond to collective trauma in Albania, please keep one ear attuned to the deep underlying core of the question of ethical responsibility. What is our ethical responsibility here, now, in our own country? Many of you have encountered in your own experiences in your host countries, the effects of state terror based on a structure of power that will annihilate any who dare to defy it. People who have, in order to survive, learned to tell power what it wants to hear and to keep their true thoughts secret. People living with a chronic pervasive fear that teaches them to distrust everyone and everything. Anyone could be an informer, a spy, trying to get information or do you harm. People for whom denial and lies are the daily bread of life. 
from the obvious lies, such as the state denying its crimes, to the daily habits people developed to survive state violence. Not wanting to know what was really happening in the gulags, shunning neighbors with bad biographies, learning to show people in power what they wanted to see while denying the truth of their own experience. But here's the thing, state terror leaves the entire society with a pervasive fear and distrust, feeling isolated and disconnected, while the persecuted are the most obvious victims of state terror. Those who survive abusive power by identifying with it are also perverted by the structures of violence. The same symptoms exist in both those persecuted by and those attaching to abusive power. Chronic and pervasive fear and distrust, lying, seeing threats everywhere they look, but the symptoms follow different trajectories as they manifest. So for the ear, you are keeping attuned to the traumatic legacies we are called to face in our own country. For the significant portion of our own population that is right now attaching to abusive power, we must also ask, how will we confront these traumatic legacies here, now? No matter what our specific history of collective trauma, here or there, until we address our traumatic legacies, the root problem structuring the social, cultural, political, and economic problems from which the people in the country are suffering, we will change nothing. This is as true for the United States as it is for Albania, as it is for your host countries. Which brings me to my second ethical question. What is the ethical responsibility of our knowing? What knowledge are we making? What is the point of knowing? What good does knowing do? By 2012, I had become an expert at Albania, which means I had published a few articles, given a lot of conference talks, and believed I knew something about traumatic legacies in the country. And then a group of former political prisoners went on hunger strike. There are a lot of angles to the story, which I will not go into here. Like everything else, it was complex, contradictory, and manifested the symptoms of collective trauma in the country. But what I want to focus on is the ethical responsibility confronting me when the calls from Albanians started flooding in. I was getting calls from people re-traumatized by the strike itself, during which two of the strikers set themselves on fire. They were triggered by the strike, by the self-immolations. I felt ethically called to respond. And I was confronted by the questions, what is the point of having understood something about the nature of collective trauma in Albania? What do I do with the knowing? My responses were multiple and varied, beginning with simply listening to the former prisoners on hunger strike. And then to the people who did not want to know about or hear about them, and to the NGOs and government officials tasked in one way or another with dealing with them. From this listening, the usual round of papers and conferences that are normal to academia ensued, as well as the rounds of embassy and diplomatic functions, press events, projects, and expert speaker appearances that are the normal in development for internationals working in Albania. All of this led to becoming an advocate, a bit of a lobbyist, if you will, for opening the secret police files of the former communist regime, which as of 2013 still had not been opened. Now, I did consult with the OSCE on um, opening the files. They did finally open the files or pass a law to open the files in 2015. And I am gratified that my work was instrumental in that process. But this raises the question, when does academic work cross the line into activism? And what does it mean for an American researcher to become an activist on behalf of issues about which we have developed expertise in our host countries? So these questions beg another round of self-interrogations. 
not just what is the ethical relation of a counter and witness and how are these ethical relations maintained, but really, if you're doing activist work with political prisoners and government officials and an international development paradigm with much of the cohort involved in wanting to suppress and deny knowledge and another part telling you things that they are desperate to have brought into public consciousness, how do you move between the politically persecuted and the government officials whose lives under the regime implicated them in the structures of persecution? Or what about when we're moving between different political parties, when everybody wants to pump us for information about what we know? And what do we do when we're moving between these worlds and we learn about criminal acts being perpetrated, often by the very people with whom we are in conversation? So in short, we return to that question. How do we inhabit the interrelated webs of power, money, and violence in development? And what are the ethical stakes of the choices we make about how to act on what we learn in the course of our research? So this last question takes on an even greater weight when we are learning about crime and corruption. It was learning about the extent of collective trauma in the country that led me to work at the intersection of academia and activism. It was learning about the details of crime and corruption that shifted me from academic doing activism to activists doing academia and eventually to bailing on academia altogether. Which returns us to Sariat and the fire the developers set on the night Kabul was falling to the Taliban. In 2015, I found out from a member of a highly persecuted family loosely in my circles that an historic Ottoman era villa, of which his family was part owner, was slated to be destroyed in a development scheme that Transparency International has called a blatant case of state capture. He asked for my help to save the monument from demolition and to bring it back to life as a center for arts, culture, and public education. Well, what was my ethical responsibility? I agreed to help. I agreed to help in part because I had come to understand that illegal development and money laundering in Albania today are repeating the crimes of expropriation from the communist regime. To fail to help, to turn my back, would make me complicit, complicit with the normative abandonment that is a second violation to Albanians persecuted under the regime, complicit with state crime today that is repeating state crime from the past that the country has never confronted. And these are crimes that are able to continue in direct relation to the willing acquiescence of the international development paradigm. So I will speed walk you through 2015 to 2021. Um, the broad brushstrokes are available in a Fulbright alumni feature about my work with autonomy and um, I do have a PowerPoint that I was going to use with you guys, but as you saw, I'm having great difficulty balancing buttons on my screen. So the share screen and the going back and forth, and it was going to be a little bit too messy. But if you're interested in it, I can make it available to anybody who wants it. And, you know, there are links to some of the things I'm referring to. So um, I found out details of an illegal development scheme that was not yet public knowledge in the country. Then I brought these details to people I knew in government, expecting them to help. Obviously, I did not yet really know how power and money work in the upper strata of captured states. The people I believed could help did not, and for many reasons. Okay, so... I got the support of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, Pivotal Places Program for the Western Balkans. The director, Haki Abazi, told me, you need to create a foundation. <laughs> I 
Right. <laughs> I'm an American professor and a trauma theorist. What do I know about making a foundation? But that was the only way we were going to be able to enter the terrain in a way that would allow us to preserve this monument. So... Um, Vincent Van Gogh of an Uwe, whose work some of you might have read, is a, a brilliant young man. Uh, Elvis Kazazi, whose family was staked in this and who'd asked my help and I, we founded the non-governmental organization Autonomy. And we set it up to serve as a public trust that would buy the monument, save it from development by both state and private actors, and steward the monument as an international center for art, culture, and public education. From 2015 to 2018, we worked our butts off and we did everything that the civil society playbook says to do to hold corrupt governments accountable and advance democracy. By 2018, we had partnerships with over 100 organizations in the Western Balkans, the commitment from my university, Georgia Southern, to partner with Autonomy, global internships already established with GSU and a slew of additional partnerships in the pipeline. And then we discovered archival evidence that the monument we were working to save had been the first U.S. legation in Albania, 1922 to 1925, and, my God, the gold mine of all gold mines, that our first minister plenipotentiary, Ulysses Grant Smith, was a relative of U.S. President Ulysses S. Grant. I mean, we had American royalty on board. His heir, M.C. McIlvain Parker, said, we support you. Yes, my God, this was a gold rush discovery that brought us into relation to Grant Smith's surviving family. And we believe guaranteed the support of the Department of State and the diplomatic communities necessary to persuade the Albanian government to drop its plans to develop Soraya. For a few ecstatic years, I believed I was working at the cutting edge of social transformation for a model of education that transcends the borders of countries and classrooms, that brings the living history of a people into the present as a resource for understanding collective trauma and transforming wounds into wisdom. These were dream years. But like I said, I had a lot to learn about how power and money really work in international development. In 2018, as the mayor of Toronto was issuing an updated letter of support for autonomy to move forward with purchasing Sariat and beginning restoration work, the government of Albania went public with the development plan that had brought me down this road in the first place. A national scandal erupted when the government pushed through parliament a special law known as the Fusha law that gave land, gave public land to a private developer in a secret public-private partnership that would turn the city center into a series of high rises owned and under the complete control of a private individual, Skelching Fusha, with all financial documents secret. The state used building a new theater as the justification for this, and renowned architect Bjark Engels gave the state its justification. He designed a new theater at the joint request of Fusha and the Albanian government. No public tender, no public discussion, no competition, no announcement of any kind, any step of the way, every single step and document to this day still secret. The scandal over this blatant case of state capture rocked the country. Protests erupted and carried on for over two years. Protesters occupied the National Theater and for autonomy, for Soraya, for our dreams of a cultural center. Well, the scandal over corruption in illegal development took autonomy off the books. There was no way. What were you going to do now? So, 
This was not merely an unapologetic Just a minute. I've gotten a lot of critical distance, but I still have a few more steps to go before I can really talk about this without being back there. So, you know, one of the questions that comes over and over and over again is how really, with the support that we had, could the government really get away with these egregious crimes. But it's not so difficult to understand when we think about what really mattered to the international development community. They had much bigger first fish to fry, like, for example, establishing a NATO airfield in Albania, securing a permanent deployment of special forces to Albania, Running the compound for the Mujahideen that the U.S. had shepherded from Iraq to Albania, as per an agreement between the U.S. and Albania in 2014, with the relocation beginning in 2016. All of which gives the lie to the civil society playbook I had been following for three years. So as it was impossible to work for autonomy, I did the only thing left. I joined the movement to save Albania's national theater, which required that I walk away from my job at Georgia Southern University. So for two years, we occupied the theater. And this was a beautiful protest. There was all of the stuff we associate with protest, you know, banners and marches and flag waving and carrying and blah, 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 blah. But I was in it for the Festival of the Arts, because what a group of artists and activists really believed was that if you showed what good could come from people working together through the arts, that this could change the mentality of the country. We staged performances, we brought shows in from Kosovo, the entire Balkan region, Europe, some people from the United States. For a period of six months, we had shows every other night, three times a week, four times a week. The square became a place of public performance, calling into question, what is the mentality of dictatorship? And what is the ethos of democracy? This went on until the pandemic. On 17 May 2020, the Albanian state exploited the pandemic lockdown to destroy the historic National Theater. This was after we had won the support of Europa Nostra and been listed as one of the seven most endangered cultural heritage sites for 2020 after a unified course of international actors, ambassadors, organizations, and institutions counseled the Albanian government to engage in dialogue and preserve cultural heritage, it was after the single most important civil society movement sustained for over two years that the country has seen since it declared independence in 1912. State violence against people protesting the demolition was brutal was universally condemned as gross human rights violations. I have a video to show you about that, but I'm not going to do it because we'll just stay focused on the good we could do. We don't need to see police beating the shit out of our young people. So the destruction of the National Theater, condemned by the international community, ruled as illegal by Albania's constitutional court, brings me back to the questions. How are U.S. academia and those of us working as academics complicit, whether we like it or not, even though we decry it, in the many forms of structural normative violences that make up the matrix of power, money, violence, and development. And I'll give you one example that I'm really struggling with. I really believed in that civil society playbook. I really believed when we got the support of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and when we found out that our first minister plenipotentiary was a relative of Ulysses Smith, 
Ulysses S. Grant. And when we got the support of Ulysses Grant Smith's surviving heirs, I believe this was a done deal. How could we not succeed? People got behind me. What did I do? I said I'd help. What did help mean? When we say this is help and give a civil society playbook and it turns out to be a fiction, what does that do to people who put all of their energy, who put their faith, their belief, and their hope behind something that turns out to be dust? So this is, this is a serious question for me. How did my arrival in Albania, in fact, recreate, despite the fact that I intended the opposite, the traumatic repetitions that the people were already living? So here are some closing reflections on the ethical responsibility of knowing. Well, my trajectory in Albania was taking me from academic to academic activist to activist doing academia. The U.S. had devolved into a country so polarized that we lived through an insurrection, are prosecuting a former president, and in 2023, had more mass shootings than there were days in the year. But the trajectory I lived in Albania is intricately related to the trajectory we have lived in the United States of America. The fields of historical and collective trauma intersect as they do also with your countries of study. So if we go to another country to research without attending to these intersections, how are we inevitably reproducing these trauma fields and hence perpetuating the structures of trauma that have shaped all of us? Which brings us back to why are we going abroad to research? What drives us? What do we think we know as a result? What do we do with our knowing and what good does our knowing do? And finally, and most importantly for me, what good do we want our knowing to do? And that's where I'll pause it and open it up for our reflections. And just to repeat, my big investment is in what good do we want? our knowing to do. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, it is, um, whew, it's hard, you know, to um, um, have a discussion uh, in the sense that um, all of us uh, are more or less emotionally attached to the subjects that we um, study and uh, I see colleagues, especially here today, you know, which are from mm -hmm. Ukraine. So um, talking about trauma, talking about distance uh, makes a lot of sense. You know, I would not even dare think about, you know, um, if they want, they can address this question. Um, I probably would like to start uh, because this very powerful and emotional uh, presentation that you have, you know, uh, made us think. I mean, while you were talking about, I was looking at the pictures of the protests and uh, the violence and so on, just to make sure that I'm on the same page with you. So thank you for not, you know, showing it, but I just wanted to remind myself, you know, what was, you know, with the collapse and everything uh, in Tirana. Uh, but um, allow me to be the devil's advocate, if you will, for today's uh, talk and ask you uh, probably something that, you uh, some of your hosts, you know, from the development community or embassies, staffers, and so on, probably have asked you uh, in order to be to be fair, right, transparent. And that is, how do you prevent the biases that you hmm. have and the emotions that you have um, developed in terms of affection 
uh, of the subjects that you study, uh, starting from personal trauma, the prisoners, all the way to the symbolic trauma, right? You know, destruction of the national theater to build up whatever they wanted to build there. Uh, and covering it up, you know, with a, a huge glossy name of very important architects uh, without, uh, as you said, consultation or or any type of a public engagement. Uh, so uh, how do you how do you answer to the people that will say, well, um, you cannot be objective because you are so much involved? So I would flip that question around. <clears throat> um. First of all, I don't actually believe there's any such thing as objectivity. I, I believe there's a difference between self-reflective, um, critical self-interrogation about our attachments and a denial about what those attachments are or a lack of deep self-awareness to understand attachments. So mm -hmm. that's the first thing I would do. I would deconstruct that. I don't think that there is any such thing as objectivity. Then I would go to what passes as objectivity. And so if what passes as objectivity is, say, strategic initiatives and policy, then I want to bring that back precisely to the question of what does it mean to understand the intersecting trauma fields of our home countries? So I'm going to use the United States because that's my home country and our host countries, the places we study. So the Cold War, we all celebrated the end of in 1989. The Berlin Wall comes down and perestroika. And then we have a huge policy agenda that comes out of the United States based on the belief that we have left the Cold War. And there is now going to be a peace and prosperity, but that's all based on a particular economic, socioeconomic, political ideology. So all of our development policy is fueled by that ideology. Now, how is that objective? <laughs> First of all, how is that objective? Second of all, our policy imposed shock therapy. The people are devastated in developing countries over and over and over again by the imposition of policies that we call rational and objective. But they're no more rational and objective than my heart opening to political prisoners whose trauma has not been able to be witnessed. So then I would take one more step in that deconstruction, which is to ask whose purposes, whose interests does the myth of objectivity serve? Because when we open that up, then we can get to some roots of the trauma structures that we're all inhabiting. Which means very simply, and 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 I want to give a qualification to this. Um, one of the most highly placed, powerful members of an international development paradigm in a conversation with me one day said, I'm not going to say names because another thing that I think is very important is that the human beings with whom I'm dealing, they all have their own story. They all have their own history. Not one of them is more important than another. We all exist in a dynamic. So as soon as I start throwing names around, then I'm implicating in a sense of judgment, you're right, you're wrong, you're good, you're bad. And this is precisely a trauma structure that I want us all to be able to step out of. Um. But this person said to me, Albanians do not want to look at the past. They want to move forward. He was very serious. And he also told me to be very careful because the people I was going up against were dangerous. Now, how do those two things go together? This is a very powerful person. It was in a phone interview. So I didn't stop him and say, excuse me, can we deconstruct that? <laughs> 
uh, before I publish the book, I'll, of course, have him look over this to make sure that my representation is fair. But if we just take this, I mean, this is like the, one of the most highly placed international development workers in the world who says to me simultaneously, Albanians don't want to look at the past. They just want to move forward. And be careful. He was serious. The people you're going up against are dangerous. Given that they set fire to Soraya, he has a point, I'd say. Right. But how do those two go together? Where's the where's the analysis? Where's the objectivity in that? Uh, Chelsea, do you want to ask your question? <laughs> I mean, Lori already knows. I have like 20 questions from this talk. Um, thank you, Lori. That was just, uh, that was incredibly powerful. And I knew it would be because, you know, when we had our last conversation, um, you talked about some of the things that you were working through. Um, I knew it would be. Um, so just really thank you. Um, incredibly engaging and powerful Um I guess, you know, I had another question written down. Maybe I'll try to tie them together. But your the statement you just made about um, this high-ranking official, um, who I'm presuming was not Albanian, right? Because you said he said Albanians don't want to. Right. Yeah, no, not Albanian. No, not, okay, yeah. It's a really interesting take because, um, you know, and I, I write about this some in my book when I talk about temporality, um, just how untrue that statement is. Um, people want to talk about the past uh, all the time, uh, but maybe not on first conversation or first interview. Um, but if you spend time with people and, and perhaps too, I don't know if this person spoke Albanian or not. I think that also can make a distinction depending on to whom you're talking. Right. Um, but I'd be very curious. Um, and um, I think perhaps too, one way to think about it is that people may often seem like they want to um, to talk about the past as though they could escape what the past has done, to try to reckon with how the past has impacted people's lives. And um, yes, there are very big attachments to the future because for some, not for all, but for there's still like a, a hope or some type of, you know, an optimistic optimism, like there's still a disposition of wanting things to be better. And that's very human. That's not unique to Albanians, right? Um, Right. But the idea that we should abandon, like, oh, no, people just want to talk about the future. Um, and in fact, too, the other thing I would kind of contend with there is that, but the future is very uncertain. So not, at least in 92, it felt very certain, right? You can look at a lot of Sally Barisha's speeches. It feels very certain, like, you know, this is, we're, we're going to Europe. That's one of the quotes I have in my book. Here we come. We're, we're going to be in Europe. We are Europe now. Um, democracy's here, right? Um, you know, Erda, democracy. Right. It's here. And we we have arrived. Um, but here we are now in 2024. And that that I those ideas about the future um, have really um, at least those ideas that existed in 92 have been very destabilized. And um, I don't know. And, and, and then also throw in too like any conversation, not with not with some of the superficial journalism, but any conversation about what's going on with migration in the UK and Albanians right now also provides such insight into how many Albanians feel about the future, right? So anyways, I just, I would, I, I love that some of the work and the questions you're calling attention to is really problematizing what I guess is very, what what seems to be a very objective measure in the, I uh, in the, uh, what's the right, in the international development world of like, this is uh, what we want people to do and think. And I guess that, so that does tie to my question though, that I had for you, um, because, you know, I briefly came for a couple of weeks um, in 2018. You know, I have my uh, Uniam um, Teatri sign, right? I am the theater. <laughs> I was there at some of the protests, um, the nights where we just sat on the lawn and people performed. I mean, it, it was quite incredible, right? And I was there in the earlier days. Um, and at that time, there was a type of hope or mm -hmm. expectation, like you said, right, that minds could shift or policies would change. This could be stopped. And um, I also remember waking up um, because, you know, a lot of the, the tearing down happened at night, but also 
I'm pretty sure whatever cycle it happened in time cycle, I just remember waking up in the U.S. at some point early in the morning to see videos on social media, right, um, of the demolition. And I guess I just wonder, because you said people ask you and look to you, especially as someone who's done work with international relations groups and as someone who, as a researcher, and also as an American, as a Western researcher, right, you hold a certain position, um, how to think about that question of what good do we want our knowing to do, but also how with our knowing do we speak to then like what happens when that hope dissipates, right? I don't want to say go away. I don't want to just mm -hmm. say like, oh, everything is, you know, hopeless. Um, it's something I'm thinking through myself. I would just um, love to hear some of your thoughts because that was to me like that moment uh really um I don't know it really um it really symbolized that and I yeah I guess I'd just be really um yeah I think that's really important Chelsea and I, I what I'd like to do is to make two threads here that kind of weave together one is what was so exciting about the theater movement is precisely that I was a part of it, but I could have been there or not. It was so extraordinary because this is something Albanians did. So the, the intelligence, the resources, the creativity, the drive, the determination, the capacity of a group of people who were so highly motivated, that is for me what remains. And no matter that that theater was destroyed, that that the the uh, the spirit, the 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 insideness that manifested, it it's still with them. I just had um uh at, at a Zoom on the 26th of November with several of the people that were in the Occupy Theater with me, or rather with whom I was in the Occupy Theater. And we had the Zoom on the 26th of November because that's the anniversary of the earthquake from 2019. So um, for those of you that don't follow Albania, the 2019 earthquake on November 26 was the largest that had happened that year. I mean, the quakes in Turkey since have been just devastating and overshadowed. And but there was there was a great deal of there was a great deal of uh, property loss, some lives lost, and we were occupying the theater. I mean, there were people there all night long. <laughs> So the people who were in the theater immediately felt the earthquakes. They started pinging each other on their messaging. Um, they figured out what was going on before anyone else had even gotten up in the morning. The people in the theater square had started organizing help. Um, within a matter of hours, there were tables set up, people from all over the City were bringing in blankets, food, supplies, stuff for the babies. Before the state could begin any coordinated assistance, the people in the theater square had become literally the point of aid in the country. I mean, this is quite extraordinary. And it's especially extraordinary given the stereotype at Albanians that they can't work together, but that everyone has to be in control. This was ridiculously put to shame when you watch these people with the cell phones, WhatsApp groups, mobilizing their cars. They were incredibly efficient. This remains. Now I want to weave that together with what good I want my knowing to do. One of the reasons that this initiative for the Center for Art, Culture, and Public Education was so important to me is because I helped. It wasn't my idea. It wasn't me saying, let's do this. And that's one of the guilts that the development paradigm bears. We walk into another place as though we have an answer. We impose what our solutions are. Doesn't matter who we are, if it's an ambassador or if it's a foreign aid worker, if you're with the UN, doesn't matter. You're in the country for three, four, five years, just long enough to say, here's the answer, everybody do this, without actually understanding what the real effects of that are going to be, long enough to make a mess, 
the mess explodes, you get to leave and go to another post and the people are left to clean up the mess. And then we get to have the story that look at everything we did to help them and they're still all messed up. <laughs> Except that wasn't help, right? It was, we're imposing, which brings us back to how we deconstruct objectivity. We're imposing an ideology we have, an idea we have in a place and on people without understanding who they are. That's the good I want my knowing to do. To really understand the human beings. And with that understanding, we open up to each other and something, and here's, here's the crux. And this is what I believe was my contribution to the theater movement. We argued all night long. I argued with everybody there. Oh, my God. They argued with me. We disagreed. Oh, But we were occupying the theater, so we kind of had to stay in argument. And the magic, the beauty, is that you get to a point where both of us change. Something in both of us changes. And in that place where something opens up in all of us, a new thing that has not yet existed can emerge. And this brings me back to the ear I wanted us to keep open, to the traumas we are called to face here now. Nothing that we did yesterday is going to help us with tomorrow. Not here in the United States, not in Albania, not anywhere. The new way of knowing the new forms that we need, they're not going to come until we've been able to open the space for something that has not yet been to emerge. And that's where I feel like my knowing can do some good because it's a knowing that says, I want to know you. Show me what I don't know. That's what I would like all of our knowing to do, to bring, because it's not that it doesn't matter. It is matter. It does matter. Everything that we've ever been able to know so far matters. It matters a lot. If we don't have that as a starting point, we have no place to begin the work of opening and emerging. Um, I'll stop there. I could ramble on a little bit more, but I think that's enough. Um, yes. Vlad has a question. Yeah, sorry. Um, hi, uh, thank you for this really, really wonderful talk. Um, and, uh, some of the things that you were saying really resonated <clears throat> a lot with me, uh, as someone who works on the former Yugoslavia and, uh, someone who, you know, grew up, uh, as a, as a child, uh, in the region and, uh, became an academic in the U S context working on the region, um, especially around these questions of trauma, um, and the way the trauma figures in our knowledge, uh, and how do we break apart those cycles of trauma through knowledge production? Uh, I guess my question is, it's kind of a big question, but do you think that these forms of knowing that you are calling for, um, and this kind of sentimental education that you went through a pretty bitter one, um, do you think that those forms of knowledge can, um, emerge in uh, an academic setting? And how do we reform academic institutions, uh, especially area studies programs, which perpetuate certain kinds of geopolitical hierarchies? How do we, refor we reform these programs to accommodate more responsibility and responsiveness from um, you know, US academics who privilege in many ways from these uh, from these hierarchies and from, um, you know, these forms of knowledge production uh, as experts, uh, et cetera. So um, it's kind of a big question, but uh, it's the one, it's one that I'm very interested in, and especially your answer, because it seems like you really went through it. Well, you are um, bringing the question that I actually wanted to make the center of the talk but I didn't think it would go over. So the first talk was really called um, Collective Trauma, something blah, blah, blah. And how crazy is it to imagine healing? 
And uh, there's another talk I did recently with for a short course with the International Relations Institute in uh, the Catholic Pontificate University in Rio de Janeiro, which really focused on this. What would it mean to make healing the new way of knowing? So that's just to say, you're asking what I really want. So thank you for the question. Now, the reason I didn't go straight into that angle is because I didn't know who I would be talking to. And how well can we receive these ideas in academia right now at this moment or at the very beginning? But there are a lot of things emerging. So, for example, um, the Campaign for Trauma-Informed Policy and Practice based in D.C. is doing a lot of work all over the country um, looking at how to bring legislation locally and nationally on making trauma a centerpiece of how we engage in any of our work. Trauma-informed pedagogy is starting to really take hold, mostly still at the K-12 to levels. After having more school shootings or mass shootings in 2023 than we had days, it's kind of about time. I think the fact that we've got so many people who have lived through two mass shootings now. I mean, my God, look at the last university shootings. Uh, the people in that who had been through school shootings in elementary school. This is horrific. I mean, really horrific. So I don't think it's a matter of if for changing our knowledge structures. I think it's a matter of when. I think there are already a number of uh, movements ongoing. There are already critical issues to which people have to respond. The problem with the university structure is twofold. One is, if we step back and look at our funding, how much of the funding for our public universities is coming from places like the Department of Homeland Security right now? Um, I just out of curiosity, I want to check every uh, biostatistics program and look at where the funding is coming from. And then, of course, AI is already radically shifting the terrain. I mean, within a matter of six months, what we're seeing in universities with AI has already radically shifted. So there are a number of things that make moving that set of questions and 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 the core. I think of the question you asked is I'm just going to say it. If knowledge production up until now has been in the service of power, dominance, social control, and hierarchy, what would it mean? to place knowledge in the service of collective healing, to place knowledge in the service of regenerative paradigms that are necessary to survive climate change. Now, I think that's the only possible direction to move. And I think we've already started that movement how quickly that movement can happen within a specific institutional framework has a lot to do with who's in the culture that can become the door opening. Now, that's going to be different in every cultural context. I left Georgia Southern because there was no possible opening <laughs> that could be made there in 2019. And I, I am very, very pained that we will see a great deal more suffering before we see substantial moves. But where my hope, and this is coming back to the question you raised, Chelsea, where my hope lies is that I'm censoring myself. <laughs> Give me a minute to get one sentence that comes out in a way that's appropriate for um, a talk that will be available on a YouTube channel afterwards. <laughs> so I'm going to go back and give you a specific example about Albania. Remember the high-ranking development 
person who told me, be careful. As an American professor in Albania, no Albanian was going to harm me. That's really true. I myself personally was never in danger in Albania. Now, the Albanians with whom I worked were. My presence was important to protect them. But if I had undertaken this initiative in almost any other country in the world, I wouldn't have had that protection. And I'm going to come back to this question because it reaffirms for me something that is incredibly important to my own sense of hope and possibility. I had the amazing privilege of being in a cultural context in which, even though I was standing in between powerful people and a lot of money, their capacity for restraint, and it was restraint, is laudable. Now, on the one hand, that also says, she's just an American professor, just wait her out. I mean, it's silly. It's all going to go away. But that's fine. I mean, I get it. I totally get that from their perspective. We were flies on the wall. And, you know, that's a nuisance. But they had as much capacity to be impatient and swat us down. They did set fire to Soraya. But we also knew that the threat to set fire was there, which is why there were barrels of water all over the villa, which is why when finally people were able to get past the police, they could put the fire out. And the governments of Albania and the United States did reach a deal to preserve that monument, which will now be a museum. So the house wasn't burned down in the end. The villa wasn't burned down. So this is the last thing I'll say um, to get to that point of change where it happens and connect it to hope. Every time we begin to work for something, we're attached to that thing. I really wanted that International Center for Art, Culture, and Education. And I didn't get it. Now, I can hold on to what we didn't get, or I can look at the important step we made. Against all odds, that villa is now designated as a museum for which the U.S. government is funding a library. It's not burned down. It's there. It was something. So it's the steps we take and how each step puts in place another step. And none of us individually is going to accomplish the thing. None of us is going to evolve that new paradigm. But if I can keep my focus on what's driving me, that's why one of the questions I'm asking is what drives us? Why are we going to do what we do? If I hold on to the object, the thing that I right now can see is this is going to be an answer, then I'm always going to feel failed. Even if I achieve that object, because if I achieve it, it's never going to be what I imagined it was going to be when I set out. But if I can keep myself focused in the process, keep myself connected to what's the driving force, keep my vision clear that I want to contribute to the movement, and not a movement like a social movement, but to the movement of humanity that can see us through a future, then I have a lot more stability in my ground and more hope day to day. Okay, well, thank you so much for all this, for this thought provoking talk. And I think I'm glad you left us with some hope. because <laughs> I'm starting to feel really depressed. <laughs> but, um, but I mean, I think that for me, the takeaways are in our work, we have to be thinking through these ethical questions. We have to um, collaborate very closely with people, you know, on the ground 
who are academics or not and kind of be tapped into their their kind of perspectives and needs and be sensitive to that and what we do. And so I hope, um, you know, to me that we continue to work in these areas, but that we just do it carefully and collaboratively, cor- collaboratively and think through these kind of ethical questions and look for those kind of moments of hope and also participate in some of the ways that you have, which seems really exciting to me. So um, we all look forward to reading your book, I guess. Do you know when that'll be out exactly, or is it? Well, no, <laughs> I, I meant the, I meant the shopping stage. And so we'll just say this out loud. I think this <laughs> needs to go to a bigger press than a university press. So I am taking the radical step of um, pitching to an agent. So we'll see if I can get an agent to take it up. If not, I'll go the university press route. Um, but I will have that proposal ready by the end of February. So wish me luck. Well, you're so a wonderful nice storyteller and I just really love listening to you. So I think the book will be very engaging. Well, thank um, you. Mary. As well as being thought provoking. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So with that, we're going to end Balkan Circle for today and give you one last hand. Thank, Thank you, so, you much. so much for coming and we will see everyone in two weeks for our next session. Thank you. Looking forward <laughs> to see everyone in two Bye. weeks. Mm-hmm. Thank you very Thanks. much for this wonderful discussion.